I needed to make my own path and that I knew that I knew that would be difficult and I knew a lot of people wouldn't understand and and that I would be facing a lot of different challenges that uh, you know the average person maybe wouldn't even know to think of. Welcome to the Art of Humanity. I'm your host, Jessica Ann. This is my podcast where you can listen for fresh perspectives with artists, leaders, authors, and your favorite entrepreneurs. You can explore creativity and consciousness, evolve your business with the art of humanity. Now, here's this week's episode. Welcome to episode 49 of The Art of Humanity. I am so thrilled that you're here. Today's episode is super special because we get into something that I've never openly discussed. The fact that I am an HSP, a highly sensitive person. A highly sensitive person is someone who experiences acute physical, mental, or emotional responses to stimulus. This can include external stimulus like your surroundings and the people you're with, or internal stimuli like your own thoughts, emotions, and realizations. If you've ever seen the movie Scott Pilgrim vs. the World with Michael Sarah. It's exactly like this. Everything is in hypercolor and the world is intense. I first discovered that I was an HSP about a decade ago, and since then it's been a constant evolution of learning how to quote unquote fit into society while carving my own path. Sarah and I share the same challenge and we discuss the a la carte lifestyle. I want to bring you something that's helped me as a highly sensitive person, blue light blocking glasses. Did you know that artificial light is destroying our melatonin sleep and health? I've been using blue light blocking glasses from Raw Optics for the past two weeks, and I've noticed a huge difference in my sleep with the time change. After the sauna, I'll put them on and go grocery shopping or to run errands, and their lenses have been proven to specifically target the harmful frequencies emitted by phones, computers, screens, and LED lights. You may have seen clear lens blue blockers, sometimes called computer glasses, but these do not block the same specific dangerous frequencies of light emitted from screens or lights that raw optics do. It's really just a marketing gimmick. The most important function of artificial light glasses is my favorite topic, to protect sleep, because artificial light actually destroys our melatonin level, it destroys our sleep quality and overall health. All the other brands out there are only focused on selling lenses that are as clear as possible, but Raw Optics offers night lenses that block all blue and green light wavelengths in order to protect your eyes, sleep, and health. I love Raw Optics because they put the most effective lens technology into the most attractive frame styles to date. It does take a bit of time to get used to the lenses, but I promise it's worth it. For my listeners who want 10% off Raw Optics glasses, go to rawoptics.com, that's R-A-O-P-T-I-C-S dot com, and enter the code ART at checkout. It was so amazing to see this review come in from Chandrash. He writes, Jessica Ann's honesty and authenticity is clearly reflected in this podcast. Blending humanity in these conversations is so beautiful. You will certainly get much more from the podcast than your expectations. In a time when we are overwhelmed with information, this podcast makes it to the list of must listen. Highly recommend. Thank you, Chandrash, for that review. Now, let's get to today's episode with Sarah Zucker. In this interview, we discuss the benefits of failure, how we're reversing the ego-based metrics of success in the new paradigm, and podcasting as a spiritual practice. Please note that this episode contains depictions of reality that some people may find disturbing. If you like this podcast, leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your pod would mean the world to me. It only takes a few seconds, so if you could go over right now to Apple Podcasts and leave a review, I'll maybe even give you a shout out in my next episode. Here's episode 49 of season five, my interview with Sarah Zucker. To get all the links and show notes from this episode, go to artofhumanity.io slash episodes. Enjoy the show. Sarah, thank you so much for joining the Art of Humanity. Thank you so much for having me. 
Yeah. So you have quite an interesting background. I love that you're from LA, or at least you've been living in LA mm -hmm. for at least eight, eight years or so. Yep. Um, and yeah, and I love that, you know, you've been using kind of your intuition and guidance as you go. And your art is just freaking phenomenal. And so like nothing else I've ever seen. So um, I'm excited to direct my listeners to your amazing work of art. And one fun fact that I learned is that you were on Jeopardy mm -hmm. six years ago today. Yes, six <laughs> let's, years let's ago today. <laughs> Congratulations. It's your jeopardy -versary. Yes, so, thank tell, you. Tell us about this experience. It was wild. It's something that I had wanted to do since I was a kid. I had watched Jeopardy with my grandparents. And as grandparents often are wont to be, they thought I was brilliant. And would tell me as a kid, you know, you could do that one day. Like they were very, very encouraging of me. And so I think it was just one of those things I had in my mind pretty much from my early days of, yeah, I could do that. That's an arena where I think I could be a contender. It's something that as, as I did go there and people probably don't realize that they tape a week's worth of shows in a day. So you're in this holding pen with all these people from all around the country and you're you're sort of sitting there and looking around and going this is a group of people i have nothing in common with i mean it's the, <laughs> the and that's very intentional they really do their best to gather people from every walk of life where everyone shares this quality that is not maybe the most forward quality that you know normally gather around which is that they're all people who retain information like a sponge. In my case, I have a semi-eidetic or photographic memory, which I say semi because a fully eidetic memory is typically associated with the spectrum. And, you know, it's sort of the Rain Man thing of saying, oh, there were 444 toothpicks on the floor. I can't do that. <laughs> it's, I'm not that good. But I That's in Hoffman, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. Like, nope, not there. Though I did have a, a college roommate who called me Rain Man because I I remember things. I don't know how or why. It is almost its own autonomous process. I just I truly absorb information and it sticks in there. And that was maybe what was so surprising about doing Jeopardy is the questions are completely randomized. A question mm -hmm. a lot of people have asked me about it. The question I probably get most of all, or second most of all, the first question is usually, what's Alex Trebek really like? And the answer is exactly how he seems. He's <laughs> he's sort of this inscrutable Canadian wizard, you know? He's, he's exactly mm -hmm. how he seems on TV. He's a tough nut to crack. But the second question I always get is, oh, did you study? Did you study a lot? And I, I always tell people... No, like you can't study because it's not like a test in school where you know, oh, it's going to be about the kings of England or whatever. Like you can't study because you have no idea. They they actually have to employ an outside firm, kind of like the Oscars do. There are all these laws about game shows. They have to make sure it's not rigged. Mm -hmm. So they employ an outside firm to make sure that the game boards are completely randomized and don't favor any one player. So no, you really, you can't study. In my case, the episode I won, I had to fight like hell for it. And I ended up winning because despite, I wouldn't have known this, but apparently I know a lot about bluegrass music and bears. <laughs> and that's like those were the categories where it was like, oh man, I okay, let's keep going. Like, wow, yeah, it's funny. It's you know, uh, there's a lot of discussion about flow states these mm -hmm. days and how that applies to art and how that applies to being productive in business and all of these things. And I would say that that is sort of what that experience was for me. It's it takes all of 22 minutes. I both remember it and remember going completely out of my body, partly because I had a migraine that day. I, I had to get there at 5 a.m. and didn't film my episode until 3 p.m. and hadn't really eaten, couldn't eat. It was, you know, it's a nerve wracking experience. You're under these studio lights all day. Mm -hmm. And I work in the media, so that's not a completely foreign concept to me. But I hadn't been sleeping that week because of just, I'm someone who, if my, if my nervous system's excited, like sleep is the thing that can then become hard mm -hmm. to get. And 
so I just the whole day it was just this head you know not just a headache but the the sensitivity to light and sound and all of it so yeah it, you know, maybe about once a year on the anniversary of it, I'll I'll glance back at the episode and see. I'm like, I don't even <laughs> look like myself. And I know yeah. it's because I can tell on my face, like I have a migraine. I was ba- I basically went into a fugue state where then I'm being asked questions and I'm answering. And again, it almost like an autonomous wow. process outside of my own ego. Yeah. So it's really cool. I'm glad I did it. Every year I kind of mark this day this jeopardy versary for me because it's it's a testament to putting myself out there even though there was a risk of failing and falling on my face and i won one episode the next episode i was soaring high i was like a light speed ahead of the others and then this isn't this life you know in the second round i got this whole category about british literature that i thought i knew <laughs> <laughs> the category I thought I knew a lot about. And I think I answered Lady Chatterley's lover for like every question. <laughs> and that was never the answer. So I really, it's important. Never fly too close to the sun. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll get burnt. Yeah. You know? The Icarus deception for sure. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting how, you know, we have to dance in that delicate line between floating and, or in that flow state and then really being mm. like kind of grounded in a way. And it's interesting because you and I both work in media and peeling back the layers of this system that we're in. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm so curious to hear someone like you that has kind of been a part of, quote unquote, the matrix or whatever Mm -hmm. you want to call it, as was I, you know, I come, my background is in news. So, you know, I kind of, we both kind of see how the sausage is cooked. And I grew up watching Jeopardy as a kid. You know, my parents loved watching the 6 p.m. news and you know, there's like this mindless numbing that happens that takes over us when we uh-huh. watch the news. Um, you know, they're emotionally modulating the way that they're presenting it to you. There's like oh, such a formula completely. to it. So it's designed to manipulate us to be addicted so that they keep making right. ad dollars. And right. I'm so curious to hear from someone like you who, you know, you say that, you know, you're under these lights, you won Jeopardy kind of. And now, you know, here it is six years later you are this like multi-dimensional <laughs> kind of creature. <laughs> I, like, yes. what, so, so talk to me about, you know, you go back in time to six years previously and where you are today. Like, just let's talk about the peeling back of the layers of not only news, but of, you know, who we're becoming as... I love that this uh, lens on things because at least personally, and I've heard from others who've kind of weirdly had the same timeline 2013 was sort of this awakening for me. Like 2012 was sort of this hugely tumultuous year. And then 2013 was the beginning of me figuring out, at least in my case, that I needed to make my own path and that I knew that would be difficult. And I knew a lot of people wouldn't understand and that I would be facing a lot of different challenges that the average person maybe wouldn't even know to think of. (laughs) And that's something that my mom used to tease me about when I was younger, that like, it's not that I intentionally do things the harder way. It's just that I'm never satisfied with the fixed course. I'm never satisfied with being told, well, here is what you get in life. If you order the fixed price menu, you're going to get, you'll get the husband, you'll get the kids, you'll get the house, you'll get the car, and then you'll die. <laughs> like, And I sort of from my youngest days knew there was a lot of existential <laughs> dread that I had around that concept. But I think like so many young people, you have to dabble, you have to try things out and see what works for you. And I think 2012 was the last time I had a full-time job employed by someone else as an employee. And in 2013, I kind of just went through this whole process of realizing like, I'm never going to be satisfied with the fixed course. I have to have an a la carte life. Like I have to be allowed to choose what works for me and what doesn't work for me. I'm, I'm simply too particular. And that's something that maybe sometimes I wouldn't say to my detriment, but it again, it, it brings up challenges that you don't have otherwise. Like I, I understand why for a lot of people 
it is nice to just go, just just give me what everyone else is having. Like, it's too hard to figure it out. I just want to collect my paycheck and I want to go be able to take my 1.5 weeks vacation and, you know, whatever. So, yeah, Jeopardy is sort of this funny touchstone for me of piercing the veil. From my youngest days, I wanted to work in TV, in film. And that's the first time I was on national television. And in this way where <laughs> when I was there and we had we had to film all these cheesy promos and stuff and I just sort of, you know, tossed mine out. And I re- remember the contestant coordinators looking, looking at everyone else and being like, yeah, she's from L.A. Like she gets it. Do, do what she's doing. Because for some people, it truly I mean, deer in headlights is the is the image that pops up like. For some people, it's such an overwhelming concept. And for me, it felt like, oh, pfft, I've been training for this my whole life. But saying all that, and this is still, I'm my, my goodness, life is always in transition. But I, I feel I'm in even more of a transitional phase now. Like the past six years sort of exist as their own chunk of time where I was really working in a certain way and towards a certain thing. And I'd say it's been within the past six months that, I've been allowing myself to loosen up my own grip even uh, even more (laughs) like that from that point Mm -hmm. on I founded a a media company with two friends of mine that that was called The Currency and that was our way of basically going Mm -hmm. look we have all these skills that others have exploited and you know in in the past where I've been an employee and, and I sort of thought you know, I could really make more money doing this if I just did this on my own, like instead of being somebody's, you know, little peon that that does these things that are actually very valuable things in our new highly mediated society. We sort of took that chance of of going our own way, doing our own thing. Mm -hmm. Within a year and a half, we were primarily building websites for people, doing branding, doing marketing, doing all that kind of stuff. And within a year and a half, things shifted so much. That was around the time that the great pivot to video paradigm happened where, you know, Facebook and and all these various companies notoriously were like, oh, we're pivoting to video. Or rather, Facebook caused all these media companies to pivot to video. So I've always Mm -hmm. kept very much... I like to keep my finger on the pulse. I like to... and And I mean that in sort of a an esoteric way. I like to kind of take the temperature of where everyone's at in the industry. And within a year and a half of founding this company, we did a thing that seemed crazy to everyone at the time. But we said, look, we have this specialty and it is making animated GIFs. And of all the things we do, making websites, doing marketing, there are a million people out there who do those things. It's very hard to compete for that work. And and by then it was like, you're competing with freelancers in other countries who will do it for a fifth of the price you'll do it for. And in 2014, we Mm -hmm. said, we're artists. And at core, we're lucky that we have minds for business. But at our core, we are artists. And what if we do this, this seemingly unthinkable thing of pivoting to animated GIF? And around that time, the company Giphy was founded. I almost want to say it was concurrent to this decision on our part. But before Giphy, there were other places where GIF worked. And I use the term GIF loosely because it is technically a file format. But even still, it doesn't play nicely with Facebook. Like people probably don't realize that the GIFs they see on Facebook are actually being converted to video. So you're seeing it. It looks like a GIF, at least if you post it natively. So again, this is all very technical, but it's all to say... But it's not like it's not even technical, even like a symbolic in a way. Yeah. <laughs> it's like removed from the matrix, removed from anything else that's controlling you. Right. And and the th- crazy thing about GIF, it, I mean, as a format, it's as old as I, I am. I mean, it's it was invented <laughs> in 1987. And I love it. Yeah. And I made my first GIF when I was, I think, 11. I found it recently using the Internet Archive. And it was like an award I made because I was really into building websites on GeoCities in middle school. And I made an award. I think I made this GIF in like Microsoft Paint that was like, you have a really awesome website. And I had scanned like a photo of like stickers, like physical stickers (laughs) that I had put on this thing. And then I, I used Paint to animate. I mean, it's something where I found it and I was like, 
the fact that I made this as an 11 year old in like 1996, how could I have known? I mean, how could I have known at that point that it's like one day you'll be an adult and this will be your profession? I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. That's insane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was really the rise of Giphy had this interesting symbiotic relationship with my company, which at that point was a partnership of two of us. And we started getting a lot of commissioned work, creating GIF animations. And then that same year, I formed a company with my then girlfriend, now spouse, Bronwyn, mm-hmm. who called Yo Merrill, which uh, because the the GIFs I was doing with the currency were primarily video based and or like graphic design based. And they were of a very... Well, we worked in a wide range of styles. That was really, we weren't doing illustration, I guess I should say. And Bronwyn is this like incredible illustrator and animator. She studied animation in college. She and I actually, when we met, I knew of a piece of art of hers called The Lesbian Last Supper because that year I had like four different people share it on my Facebook timeline to be like, have you seen this? This is so your sense of humor. Like people can just that thing where sometimes something comes up and people see it and they're like, Oh, I know who would love this. Sarah would love this. So all these people had shared it with me. And then when she and I started talking and we were planning to go out, I, you know, being the lurker that I am like Googled her realized she was the artist who had created this thing. Wow. And was so (laughs) stoked to go out with her and like, Oh my gosh. (laughs) This amazing first date. And it just everything took off from there. Wow. Um, That's so cool. It is cool. And it's it's something I had realized, I think, when I was a lot younger, which is that there are sort of two modes of thinking that I have noticed in people, which is either I'm a creative person, therefore I need my partner to not be creative because it threatens my creativity or it I need to be special or or just not not to make a negative of it that I need someone who's more stable and grounded than I am to help me stay mm-hmm. <laughs> alive and fed and clothed. Yeah. There's that mode of thinking. And I realized when I was in my early 20s, I think, that I needed the other mode, which is I think the person that I end up being with needs to also be creative because I fundamentally need to be understood on that level by someone who also gets it, who also understands what it is to have creativity flow through you, to feel the specific (laughs) pains of being creative, you know, or uh, of being professionally creative, of which there are so many. But at that time, in my early 20s, I thought that that was a male individual. Mm -hmm. So yeah, (laughs) in time, yeah, in time, it's fun. I guess it's all been a process of like, sometimes we're so close to having it right. Mm -hmm. And it's just this one little detail we're we're stuck on that if you let go of that one little detail or sort of open it up to other possibilities, everything can come true for you. Like, there really is something to be said for like, Trust that you know what you're looking for to a certain degree, but maybe don't get so fixated on the details. Yeah, um, definitely. It's so important, yeah. I think, to know when to surrender and know when to mm. kind of use that doing mentality, you know? And, and I think, yes. you know, when you found your partner, you kind of just surrendered. You're like, wow, this is amazing. There's so much creativity going on in that dynamic between you and your partner, and you trusted in that surrendering so yeah and since then it sounds like it's just been one win over the next it's funny you say that because the way we actually got started working together and first off it was helpful because I'm a super visual person and I'm I'm a writer I mean that's that's my original sort of I mean, I've always made visual art, but I don't have any training in it. I make it the way I make it. And I can't really like someone can't say to me, hey, could you actually, you know, make that look a little different with visual art? I don't have that capacity. I make it the way I make it. But with writing, writing, I've studied writing is a skill that I took a lot of time to learn. And it's particularly why I prefer writing for the screen, though. Even that is something I'm loosening up on a little bit. I like writing for the screen because you're writing pictures. You're using your words to paint a picture for people. And because Bronwyn is this incredible illustrator and animator, 
we realize like, oh, this is really harmonious. This really, neither of us step on the other's toes. She can, mm-hmm. she can bring these things, the, all these ideas I cook up, she can bring them to life in a way that I never could. I love to draw. I love to paint. But again, it always ends up the way it ends up. There's no like, oh, Sarah, could you make it look a little more like a human being and less like an alien? It's like, nope, <laughs> it looks like <laughs> what it looks like. You know, I'm right. using the tools yeah. that I have, but she has the capacity I mean, she's just has that gift of she can make things photorealistic. She can make things cartoonish. She can do it in the style of another artist. She can do it in her own style. So we actually, when we started working together, she, I think, was a little, she was inspired by the fact that I, at that point, had for a year been working for myself and had been, I mean, Lord, it felt like I was tap dancing on thin ice, but had made it work, you know, had cobbled together this living working for myself Mm-hmm. And she she really wanted that, too. And I really wanted that for her. So in early 2014, we concocted this idea to do a children's book together that we decided to do on Kickstarter. And we were talking about this the other day because it is funny how the most beautiful flowers can grow out of a pile of shit. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> yeah. this project we came up with together was just such a failure like it was such a falling on our faces i mean we put so much work into preparing this kickstarter doing the preliminary artwork for all the characters i hadn't like written the book yet but i'd written a little bit to show because it was going to be rhyming it was we both are obsessed with dr seuss so it was very much inspired by dr seuss and as soon as we put this kickstarter up God bless the people in our lives. A lot of people were very supportive. They donated money. But when you do something like that, and and I have said, I'll never do a Kickstarter again. I think it's for some people, it's exactly the right thing to do for myself and the way I like to do projects. It was just all all wrong. And for it's right for some types of projects. For this type of project, we had people being like, so what is this money going to? And like the honest answer was like, you're paying us you'd be giving us money so that we can afford to live without having jobs so that we can actually create this, which I think is totally legitimate. Like artists have to buy groceries too, but we live in this hyper-capitalist society where other people who have jobs and feel that they're working really hard doing menial things for their money are very (laughs) like loathe to part with it Mm -hmm. so that you can follow your dream. Mm -hmm. A, and B, as we kind of got into this, we started getting a lot of unsolicited advice about how we should go about doing it, which we sort of weren't anticipating and kept getting the question of like, so, or rather the unsolicited advice of like, well, what you should do is go to elementary schools and read this and, you know, really promote this in elementary schools. And my answer was always sort of like, uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't really like children that much. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, I like some children individually, I think are awesome, just like some people individually, I think are awesome. But like, as a group, I find children very overwhelming and I, and I mm-hmm. generally avoid that. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, so even that, that we like, we thought to do a children's book and that like my own mother called me out on like, yeah, you don't really love kids. And my answer was always Dr. Seuss didn't like kids. <laughs> Dr. Seuss never had to go read to children. He just wrote these amazing things because he had this incredible whimsical mind and had this unique style of art. And I thought that was enough, mm-hmm. you know, but, yeah. but in this day and age, like everything is branding, branding, branding. Right. And I realized I was like, this is a branding problem if I am not crazy about like hanging out with groups of children children Mm -hmm. so it's all to say you know a kickstarter it lasted about a month we knew it wasn't going to meet its mark and by the end we were going thank god we were so grateful because if it had met its mark then we would suddenly have all this money and all this expectation of us doing this project that through the course of doing the kickstarter we learned no like i don't want to do this <laughs> this sounds like a nightmare like i don't want this life i don't want to be a children's book author but out of that a it brought us together because it was it was a failed it was a miscarriage you know it was like a, a project we had invested so much in together that just failed it just fell apart in a way that was 
traumatic Mm -hmm. and public like it was a public failure it's one thing when you fall on your face and you can kind of like quietly lick your wounds it's another when it's like oh no we told every single person we've ever met about this every day for a month and now we know people know it didn't happen it didn't work Mm. it was it was it was embarrassing Um, yeah I think there's a humbling that happens when, you know, you experience failure. I think that failure is, in retrospect, is a great thing. You know, in the moment, it's so painful. But now that you're on the other end of that, it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I mean, that's why I say we were talking about it the other day, because what we learned through it was how much we could trust each other, how much we could rely on what, it's one of those things that weirdly, one should wish for early on in a relationship that you have something that's trying, not catastrophically trying, but like something like this where, you know, it wasn't the end of the world. It wasn't something catastrophic. It was just our egos being bruised mm-hmm. a little bit. Yeah. And it showed us how much we could rely on each other. And it showed us how much, how strong our bond really was and how strong our collaborative bond really was. Yeah. And within a month of this thing failing, We got a commission to do because we had to do some gifts together where we created some gifts together for the Kickstarter because she had seen what I had been doing with GIF with my other company and how it had started. You know, it had been become, if not insanely lucrative, it was something where I was getting a decent amount of work doing it. And it was very fulfilling for me. And she sort of saw that and said, you know, I'm an animator. I can do this, too. So we had done some gifts for this Kickstarter. And someone saw that and we ended up getting this commission to do a gift series for the Brooklyn Museum. So we went from like failed Kickstarter that we wish <laughs> that we wish we could just erase to all of a sudden getting not just a commission, but an incredibly high visibility commission that was the first of its kind. Museum of, had never commissioned mm. a gift series. It was sort of in these days where GIF was not seen as high art. I mean, to a lot of people, it still isn't. But again, I use the term GIF loosely. I mean it as any short form animation, preferably looping, but not mm-hmm. necessarily. That, that's how I think of a GIF. And when I make a GIF, I'm often making... 10 versions of the same animation. I make a high res video of it. I make a lower res video of it. I make a high res GIF file of it. And then I make a really low res GIF file of it that works like platforms like Tumblr have a size limit, like all these things that over the years, it's become my expertise. I know about all the different platforms and all their different needs and file size limits and all of this stuff. And that has proven to be good for business to to know these things. Definitely. Yeah, it's so interesting because, you know, you were talking about earlier how you weren't satisfied with the fixed price menu. I think as an entrepreneur, you learn to appreciate the flow, you know, the ups and the downs because you're not on the fixed price menu. You're not signing up for a stable, steady paycheck. You know, you don't know where your next client is going to come. So when you experience a failure, you know, you know, after you've had enough failures, you kind of know and you can feel into the fact that something else is brewing on the horizon. You don't quite yet know what that is. Absolutely. I was at an artist residency last year that was for theater, which is my bachelor's degree is in theater. And it's an arena I'm starting to work in a little more after about 10 years away. And I was at this artist residency where I was a visiting artist and they had all these, you know, college kids who were working this residency, essentially, like it's a summer program for them. Mm -hmm. And as part of it, they want there to be this, uh, you know, mind share or like, you know, it's enriching for them. Like it's that's huge as a college student to get access to these working artists. And so they encourage us, you know, all to sort of mingle at dinner. And I was sitting and I can't even remember how it came up, but I was talking about this concept. I was talking about how at I at 22 years old with all that vim and vigor and sparkle in my eye of like, I'm going to do great things in the world, could not have possibly seen how failure is such a necessary part of the process that you sometimes need. You need to try things that fail to find out what you're really after, to find out what not just what will work, but 
to find out, like I said, with the children's book, to realize the thing I thought I wanted isn't even what I wanted, that I'm recognizing there are pieces of it that are what I want, but I pointed myself in the wrong direction and, and I was too forceful and that's why it didn't work out. You know, I was going through all this talking about how important failure is and how it will surprise you how often you fail and how I've actually come to embrace fa- failure very actively, like, and kind of when when something is not happening or when it does fall apart, that it almost gives me joy in a certain way because it's like, well, at least I know this isn't the thing. <laughs> totally. And there was a young woman, this theater major at a college similar to the one I went to, who's sitting across from me. And as I'm talking about this, I'm watching her face just express this mixture of fear and revulsion. And finally, she blurts out, well, I don't want that. I don't want to fail. Like, I, I don't like this. If you're telling me that this is what a life in the arts is, that it's just a constant series of failures, I reject that. I think you're wrong. And that's not my plan. That's not what I'm going to do. You obviously triggered her. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I. she got real upset with me. You know, I listen. And again, I wasn't smug about it. But the thing about it was I'm looking at this young woman and just thinking, you're me. Like, I I get it. That's exactly how I felt at 22 as well. In my mind at 22, it was like, oh, well, yeah, but but you don't get it. I'm hot shit. Like, I'm amazing. I'm not going to fall down like that. I'm just going to go pick up my Oscar now. You know, like that sort of unearned confidence you have as a young person who goes to a good school or whatever, like you haven't been knocked down yet. You haven't been tested yet. Mm -hmm. And it is, that's why I say it's a mixture of, it was a mixture of revulsion for me and what I was saying and fear that I might be right. Mm -hmm. Fear that like, what do you mean? I'm not going to just go get my dream gig and then be the toast of the town. Yeah. Like, what do you mean that it's Because my point about failure is that if you're going to have a life in the arts, You have to really seize on the notion that it is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Mm -hmm. It is a life. It's a journey. And the failures are like these rocks that plunk down in the river and change the flow of the river. That's good. You want that because you have to learn how to direct your intention to go after the things that really are the big things for you, that really are the big things that are meant to be like your core values you know i always just go back to how do you want to feel you know i interviewed danielle laporte and she's all about the core desired feelings you know feeling into that and then designing a life around that particular emotion and then not saying yes to anything that isn't aligning with that particular emotion yeah and it's interesting because there's such a correlation i think at least it was for me when you know we remove ourselves from the matrix when you're in it you can't actually feel how much you're controlled by it But then, you know, when you step away from it, you can see how it's all designed to get you living in fear. You know, it's all designed. Mm -hmm. It's all directly related. And I want to talk to you more about a century of the self and all that good stuff. We have so much. (laughs) My favorite Yeah, we have so much to dive into. (laughs) Um, Well, the thing with social media, I was I was saying, I don't know if this analogy came through, but fundamentally is is just a technology and all technology is good. I've personally never been of a Luddite mindset. Like it again, you can't put the cat back in the bag. Like things have to move forward. But, you know, I hear a lot of social media bashing these days and it's not unfounded. I think social media has adversely affected a lot of people's mental health. I think that there's a lot from it that can be detrimental, but It's akin to saying a hammer is evil because you can hit your thumb with a hammer. But right. It's like you also can build a house with a hammer. You can build a city. It's all to say that, you know, a technology can, of course, hurt you if it's used incorrectly (laughs) or if you use it without mindfulness. But it's still a technology. It's still there in service of making humanity better. And I think that with social media, personally, I sort of feel in this way where I I see both sides of it. I I too know that feeling of it affecting my mental health in a way that is detrimental. But I also feel that I don't have the option to opt out. I know I know a lot of people who who have opted out. They say they're happy with that choice if I can speak to them directly, but it's also to me 
again, I think that's a privilege. I think for many of us, it's a necessary component of our career and of our trajectory of what we wish to accomplish in this lifetime. It allows you to bypass certain gatekeepers. It allows you to be your own broadcast station. It makes it possible for us to know if there's a hate crime that happens, like in real time. It allows for so much good, and it ultimately really is just an extension of our humanity. It's us extending our neurology out of our body in a way that is physical and connects us to each other in real time. So anything that people criticize about social media, really they're criticizing about humanity that we contain a lot of shadows, that it calls into question a lot of the performances that play into the Vanity Fair that we call society. Yeah, I love it. But that's not social media. That's us. Exactly. And yeah. It's so trippy because as a very sensitive person, I can kind of see how it benefits me personally. I love social media because of that, because it's like one step removed from, you know, the interactions that you have that are just can be so mm, brutally mm -hmm. painful, you know, and really, really hard, really hard for me to kind of be in person sometimes at certain situations because Same. of that. So yeah. social media has provided me a window into the world that, you know, I can access and tap into when I can't otherwise. So in a way, it's almost like this vortex of possibility for me being in a body and being in this human body on earth yeah. is just is really hard, <laughs> you know? So yeah. I feel like for all these people out there who are highly sensitive, it really allows us to be truly who we are as right. a human it is, being. It is transhuman. It's allowing us in certain ways to transcend the challenges of our physical embodiment. And for some of us, that is hugely beneficial. For others, it's terrifying and bad and challenging. And I think for most of us, myself included, it's a little from column A, a little from column B. Yeah. And I think it goes kind of to your point earlier about like how you don't want to be a Luddite and you don't want to completely cut off from social media. Anytime I feel that way, I realize I'm in my ego. I'm really mm. being like, oh, how many likes am I getting? And it's really this obsessive yes. compulsion uh -huh. that I'm like, I just want to opt out of this. I don't want to be a part of it. And then uh -huh. I'm realizing like, wait a second, I can use Instagram as my painting, seeing it as a canvas yes. instead of how many likes and how popular, because that's how I love using Instagram. Yes. And it's important to notice the difference in your mindset when using it. Yeah, it's funny. I just got to spend a week with one of my best friends on a vacation, and it was so nourishing. And her dad is this very sort of enlightened person. And she was telling me, because we were talking about some of these things, and she said this thing that her dad said to her, that I think is like, I wish everyone had this piece of information that whether someone gives you a thousand insults or a thousand compliments, it should have the same effect on you. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that speaks to that, that we can, it's very easy to allow what are our naturally compulsive human behaviors to fixate on that, to fixate on the numbers, to fixate on the attention, to want it so badly. And this is what I say about that I've been examining my own use of it, because on the one hand, I still very much believe in the power of it, very much believe in having a platform for what I create to get out in the world, to reach people who need to see it. I have people who reach out to me and tell me, like, thank you for creating what you created. I needed to see it. And that is something that I think is essential. But I also, like everyone, th there's an artist who did a zine that I really like. The title is how a photo and video social sharing network gave me my best friends, a great career, the love of my life, and made me want to die. <laughs> and <laughs> that's like sums up what I think a lot of us, how we feel about Instagram, because I'm going, look how much good has come out of it. Look how my whole career has flourished because of this thing. And yet sometimes I use it and I'm just like, oh God, I hate this. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm dabbling in right now is trying to break the compulsive part. One of the ways in which I do that is I use an app called Freedom that allows you to set time periods that cuts off your access to whatever sort of networking you want. Like you could have it cut off all your internet. It has a setting where you can just cut off access to social media, which is very useful for me. With a lot of the projects I do, I have to do research and stuff mm -hmm. and I require Google and Wikipedia and all these mm -hmm. things. But it's like to make it literally so if I click on Facebook, it does not load until a time I specify. Mm -hmm. And I found that has been especially useful for me because I put my art on Instagram and I have a little bit 
I'm not super rigid about it, but I like to post in the morning to kind of get it out of the way, like if I have something to share. And then I turn off and then I use freedom to turn off Instagram until like much later in the day. And I'll let myself go and I'll check. And then I get that one feeling later in the afternoon that, oh, look at all these likes and nice comments I got instead of spending all day in the spiral of checking it. Refresh, refresh. Who Um, wants to do that all day? It's so silly. Like, yeah. Right. And yet I do if I, you know, I'm right there it, with you. Yeah. It's like if I'm not being mindful mm-hmm. about it. Yeah. And again, it's the thing I'm saying about said about the matrix, like you can't truly opt out. Like I think and if you do, it's like at what cost? You know, I think there's too much you lose. For me personally, that's my feeling. If you just say none of this, I'm going to go live in a cabin in the woods and like completely mm-hmm. disconnect. That doesn't sound good to me either. Like I would not enjoy yeah. that. But by the same token, you can't be so in the matrix that you forget you're in the matrix. So I'm exploring this space that I would describe as the liminal space. Mm, I love the space. This is my I, favorite I, space to yeah. be in. <laughs> I think that's Maybe. why we vibe so hard. I, I <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. I got to see this great talk when I was in Portland last week between Eric Davis and Jennifer Dumpert, who are married, and they both had oh, books come out. This yeah, past I hung year. out with Eric at his book signing at City Light. He's awesome, actually yeah. one of the first guests on the season, Eric Davis. Yeah, episode oh, that's 44. Amazing. Yeah, I think that guy is so rad. I like love, love his, his mind. mind. Totally. This talk was so cool because I've been reading her book and it's called yeah. Liminal Dreaming. Mm-hmm. And it's about dream work involving hypnagogia, which is essentially that space between waking and sleeping because dreaming happens in REM sleep when you're asleep asleep. Hypnagogia is like that thing where your leg will jerk all of a sudden or you think mm-hmm. you're falling as you're falling asleep. And What was so cool about this talk, first off, it was like hashtag relationship goals. Like they had such a great energy together. I mean, they've been together Mm -hmm. a long time. They just that thing where two people you're like, oh, my God, they click and flow so well. It was such a gift to get to hear them talk with one another, but that they both realized both of their books while being about completely different things they both share this concept of liminality, of people who were liminal in the case of his book and being in a state of consciousness that is liminal that we all experience every day. And it's gotten me chewing on the concept of liminality. For me, I feel I am most comfortable in liminal spaces and that that, I'm really grateful for that, that all the things I am, I've always felt I'm only half that thing, you know, and I often use the imagery of like one foot in, one foot out. You need to have Um, that one foot out. And And I think Eric cautions about that too, because it's so easy to go down these reality tunnels and become delusional. So it's always important to have that one foot in. (laughs) Exactly. Right. But it's like, and that's, I guess, the ability to occupy liminal space and embrace a liminal attitude. And I guess that's what I'm saying about social media. I think our attitude as a whole would be served well by being more liminal overall. Because I sometimes tire of hearing people shitting on it because I kind of go, right, and we wouldn't have had like Black Lives Matter and we wouldn't have had Occupy Wall Street. And we would like, there's so much that came out of social media because of what a powerful technology it is, that when people start shitting on it, I just kind of go, yeah, that's awfully easy to say it's bad because it made you feel poopy because you saw someone who has tighter abs than you. Like, it's so Mm -hmm. ego based when we dump on it. And like, as a whole, even the notion of privacy itself look, I'm not saying it's not important, especially after the 2016 election. But if humanity were a more unified organism, there would be no privacy anyway. I just think it's a valuable question to ask. Again, it's not an answer, but to just consider that it's like part of our obsession with privacy is related to our obsession with ownership, related to our obsession with separateness, related to our obsession with borders and boundaries and us versus them. And I think the only way humanity is going to survive as a species is if we cut the crap already, is like acknowledge there is no us versus them. There's only us versus nature. And computers are an Mm -hmm. extension of us. So there's no man versus machine. Machine is man. It is an extension of civilization. And it's really this question of like, are we going to come together on Team Human, to use Douglas Mm -hmm. Rushkoff's term, 
or are we going to just let it all yeah. fall apart? Yeah, I also interviewed Rushkoff in my podcast as well. And mm-hmm. I think it's important to stay in your body, you know, and it, it's this embodiment of the yes. knowledge. It's the embodiment of the technology, not in a transhumanist way, because we don't want to just be mm-hmm. like absorb the technology through our body. We want to be at one with right. it, but also separate and know that we have our free will attached yeah. to us. That's a part of our souls. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Right. right. That totally. It is a tool. We are not doing our job correctly if we let our mm-hmm. tools control us. Like, that's not how it's supposed to be. And I think that when people get upset about social media and get in a tizzy where they're posting these, you know, weird cryptic statements about don't steal my photos, it's that. It's like, well, this tool yeah. doesn't control you. Like, that's not right. The whole point of it is that we should wield our tools wisely. And it's not the tool's Mm -hmm. fault if we mess it up. It's that everyone needs to be more integrated. We need to be more in touch with our own humanity. And then we won't have these human problems. Totally. And I think that there is almost like a timeline. At least I've noticed personally that as I continue integration and downloading these wisdom Mm. in this liminal state, you know, and you talked about how 2013 was a turning point as it was for me and so many people. I think we're kind of slowly on this wave mm-hmm. of ascension and on this wave of waking up. And I keep using the word full circle, but it's kind of coming back down into reality after you go far out into mm-hmm. this world. I was living in LA up until right. recently and I kind of was in this liminal state. I was going through this deep healing process and I was able to sleep for almost 14 hours one night because I was healing from this injury that came out of nowhere. <laughs> Nothing caused it. It was just like it required me to sleep a lot. And it was such a blessing because I was able to tap into this liminal state and get these downloads of how I'm supposed to integrate that state into the reality, into real life, which there's no other way to do it besides, of course, psychedelics. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Which I'm a total, you know, we can talk a little bit more about <laughs> that, but I don't necessarily do that because I can have these downloads in a way where I kind of can stay quote unquote sober, but access yeah. a different version of myself through this liminal state. So I'm curious, like, do you find that there's a similar timeline happening with you? And how are you integrating this wisdom and, or these downloads into your work in the world? Yeah, I mean, it's completely analogous to what you're saying. I mean, I similarly, four years ago, had a health crisis out of nowhere, a similar type of thing that just required me to really like slow down and look at my life and look at things and just I couldn't rush, rush, rush anymore because it was like, oh, you got to just get better. And it's funny how that can sometimes it can be such a gift because you wouldn't stop and look at everything otherwise. And for me, like I said, it's really been in this past six months or even the past year where, right, again, everything I've been on this journey of years. And in the past year, it's taken on a different tone, which has been one of, okay, you healed. Like that's not an ongoing process in a certain way, but not feeling so much like I need to retreat and keep healing. I'm feeling myself emerging and I'm feeling myself going, right, I need to now apply some of these things and I need to speak. Like I have a gift for speaking and I wish to speak. And I think for a long time, I wasn't. I was very much in fear of the changes in my own life, in fear of the changes in society, in fear of saying the wrong thing which I do. We all do. We all say the wrong thing sometimes. But there's nothing wrong when you're in your truth. And if you express it, you just free up so much of that resistance. So as long as you're speaking to your truth, everything's going to work out in your favor. And speaking with an intention of kindness and an intention of wanting to help people and wanting to help yourself and not an intention of hatefulness. Because, right, sometimes I find I am someone who I have to say things out loud to know how I feel. (laughs) And when you are like that, not that I don't have an internal monologue, I certainly have at least one. But sometimes I just have to say things to hear how they sound. And then my friend Colin Francesetto gave me a good phrase for that of like, I reserve the right to contradict myself. (laughs) Because sometimes I will say a thing just to hear how it sounds. And I am a bombastic personality a little bit. I'm a storyteller. So sometimes I will maybe overstate the case or be too emphatic or too dramatic. And in time, I'll go, yeah, maybe I was right. 
maybe it's not so apocalyptic as all that. Or maybe I'll go, as soon as I said the words, I realized, nope, that is actually not how I feel at all. Um, and that, <laughs> Yeah, it goes from one extreme to the other. Totally. You know, for me, and, um, by saying it out loud, you realize how extreme you are. <laughs> right. And you're like, oh, shit, that was in there? Like, that was inside of me? And even that, being open and honest with yourself enough to know that you contain contradictions and knowing that they come from different aspects of yourself and none of those aspects are evil or bad, like all the various facets of yourself exist to serve you and to help you. And that one aspect of yourself might feel one way and the other aspect feels completely the other way. And in fact, with most things, that's what we're operating with is like, wow, I can I within myself contain two completely contradicting opinions about any given thing. And depending on like any given day, how much I've slept, how much I've eaten, one or the other might win out. You know, mm -hmm. we're not always able to be our most loving, kind selves. Sometimes we're grouchy and hungry and say mean things. I don't know. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's all about using the paradox to work right. for you instead of against right. you, instead of thinking that you have to fix yourself. There's nothing to fix. It's about integrating both sides of you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's really, yeah, for me, it's this past year, I've allowed so much to emerge because the process of all these things, all these metaphysical concepts and steps towards healing, steps towards living a better life. A lot of times we learn something intellectually and then it takes years to put it into practice like in our lived life. Mm. And I'm grateful that this past year I'm starting to see some of the actual physical application of some of these things that I maybe intellectualized four years ago, but I'm only just now being able to go, you know what? Yeah, like I shouldn't live my life in fear. I should really do what my heart is called to do. Even though, and maybe especially if there's a risk of falling on my face and embarrassing myself or saying the wrong thing and someone getting angry at me, and then we can have a discussion and then there can, and you can be say opportunity kumbaya. for growth. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like maybe I will be the first person to admit when I'm proven wrong. I certainly am not someone who says things and then will die on that hill just totally. because I said it, you know? Yeah. It softens your ego. You're like, you know what? You don't always have to be right. And then once yeah. you live in that place, you surrender to life and it's not right, wrong. It's just bliss. It's just the good and the bad. It's just taking it all in and then integrating totally. it. Totally. It's funny we opened this episode with talking about Jeopardy and that this is my jeopardy anniversary because every year I'm on this earth, the more and more I sort of grasp this concept that I could fill libraries with the things I don't know. You don't know what you don't know, you know? Like, there's so much to learn and there's so many facets of so many things. And while it's wonderful to remember trivia about who was the costume designer on some obscure film from the 1960s. That's all nice and good, but like it ultimately is just a fun thing that I really am now leaning into how much I don't know and mm -hmm. how freeing it is to go, yeah, I don't know everything. And in fact, I know very little <laughs> in the grand scheme of knowable things. And I love and not it, knowing. It's so freeing. Yeah, it's freeing. It's exciting because it's like, oh, no matter how long I'm on this earth, how long I get the privilege of being alive, there's always going to be that excitement of discovering a thing you didn't know. Totally. And the space that I have allowed myself now in this past year to move around, to take up I mean, I already am multidisciplinary, but I've started taking up disciplines that I've always wanted to do, but have always self-policed, have always said, nope, you don't have a gift for that. You shouldn't do that. Oh, no, Sarah, like that's not one of yours. And this year I'm kind of going, ah, fuck it. I want to do it. And you have to be willing to put yourself through that period where you're bad at it <laughs> to get to yeah. that moment, how beautiful that moment is where something you have been bad at for a long time because you've applied yourself and practiced it as a discipline. There will be that breakthrough moment where suddenly you're like, hey, yeah. I'm not so bad at this anymore. <laughs> I crave that. That has been yoga for me. Like I took up yoga three years ago and the first two years were excruciatingly difficult. Like my body is not built naturally flexible the way some bodies are. 
And I, like so many people, had like gym class trauma. Like I had trauma about competitive sports. Like I'm not a competitive person. I really, mm-hmm. competitive sports always reminded me so much of war and bloodlust. And I hated them. Like I hated, mm-hmm. I don't watch sports. I did sports because I like to be physically active, but I sort of always hated that part of it. And I realized as an adult that it caused me, I'm a writer, I sit at a desk a lot and I was starting to just be like, just so like crumpled up and in pain all the time. That again, it's like a physical crisis that led me to go, you must do something about this. That's so great. Yeah, I love it. And And I think there's something about that yogi mindset too, that is so liberating in and of itself. Because I came to yoga after being a runner for so long. And it was that Mm. like, go, 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 like winning mentality to this humbling yogi mentality of like, there is no winning in yoga. Everyone is on the mat working through their own individuation. Exactly. And exactly. And I think that's really like what is widespread throughout the collective consciousness at this point. And it triggers a lot of people. It's funny. I just saw something I posted three years ago that triggered a lot of people Uh getting out of that ego-based mindset It was this quote, I have to remember who said it originally, but it's don't be impressed by money, followers, degrees, and titles. Be impressed by humility, integrity, generosity, and kindness. It's so funny to see how people reacted because so many people Mm. get triggered by that because they're like, wait, I have a degree. I have a master's degree. Doesn't that mean anything? I have a million followers. Doesn't that mean anything? I made it to reach that level of success. Doesn't that mean anything? And it's funny watching like the comments trickle in and being like, and everyone that kind of commented was like, I was purely triggered by it because Uh, they wanted people to be impressed by them. And uh it's kind of reverse engineering the new paradigm into this humbling, awe-inducing way of being on this planet where none of that matters. Right. And it's so beautiful. Yeah. And again, it's the liminal thing. It's like I often invoke the Cheshire cat. I mean, that quote, I can see why it upsets people, because if you choose to take it personally, what you're hearing is, hey, you're invalidating all these things I've worked really hard at to get for myself. And nobody likes that. Nobody likes to hear that the things they have in their bucket are now invalid. I think a lot of our political fights essentially boil down to that. Hey, don't invalidate my thing that gives me a leg up over other people. Totally. And I just sometimes wonder, I guess the liminal part of it is I wonder if the way forward is going. The problem is that our society has valued all those things over humility and kindness It's like yin and yang. Both are fine. I think that it's like people are, again, it's too apocalyptic to hear something like that and then immediately go, hey, don't invalidate all my things. Mm -hmm. And the answer is no one is saying that your master's degree is going to burst into flames and not exist anymore. We're just saying that maybe that's not the only marker of success. That maybe those and money and followers Look, again, they're powerful tools. Money is a powerful tool. Having a lot of followers can get you a lot of opportunities, sure. But in and of itself, it doesn't mean you're a nice person who's happy. And then to not use those tools or those ways of operating in the world as the only foundation for success. There are different versions of success. right? And when you can tap into that, there's a whole new way of existence. And in a way, as an entrepreneur, the master's degree does burst into flames every second. (laughs) I know (laughs) because none of that matters when you're running a business and you're operating in this way it's like accessing that liminal state to be able to tap into different states of emotion so that you can transcend your current reality not in a way that's bypassing but in a way where you can actually integrate and coming into your like true self and your true divine nature Right. You don't learn integration in grad (laughs) school. Speaking as someone who went through that, in fact, you very much are encouraged. You learn the opposite. You learn separation. Mm -hmm. Like I went to grad school because I was terrified about what I was supposed to do with my life, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's that. It's basically going, okay, like if you decide to stay in academia, maybe it's valuable, but otherwise you're just delaying the inevitable, which is that eventually you're going to have to figure out how to integrate into life. Like you can't stay there. Totally. Forever. And then um, I feel like it ties into both sides of that spectrum because it's like you want to be able to be an academic, you know, as a writer, as you are, as we mm-hmm, both are, mm-hmm. you know, you want to be able to tap into that brainiac state. But then you also want to find a way to kind of integrate that into your body where it's not all this research and data and numbers that your eyes just roll. (laughs) And both are important. And that's the part. I guess that's what I'm saying is like, and it's the same thing I was saying about social media and with so many things is it's the classic 
I think it's, you could call it like the revelation of the neophyte. Like once you first have that realization of like, wait, hey, we should be valuing kindness more than we value money. We should be valuing humility more than we value followers. It's very easy. They call it the zeal of a recent convert. It's very easy when you have some of these revelations to then go, this is it. This is the answer. This is what I've been missing. And you lean 100% full throttle into this new realization. And then in time, ideally, what you come to is some of those things I threw out, those are important too. Being intellectual is important, but it's not the only thing that's important. It's that is you come to a place again of the middle way of yin and yang, of balance, of recognizing that just because we have certain things in society that are weighted too much to one side doesn't mean it helps us at all to weight society completely to the other side. You really do need both aspects in Mm -hmm. harmony. Yeah. And it's interesting because like for me, podcasting, I've been doing this for a few years, season five. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was totally kind of outside of my comfort zone when I first started, but I just kind of felt called to, I got this download and I just kind of started putting myself out there more. Mm -hmm. And it's just the most liberating thing when you can find that duality in your personality and be able to express Mm -hmm. yourself through this channel because like I meet and talk to people like you who I get so stuck in my ways sometimes in my head and I'm reading and not really putting it back out into the world. So Uh it's being able, for me personally, that's how I've used the contradiction and paradox of my own personality is instead of just absorbing content and reading and listening to podcasts, I'm actually reaching out across the interweb, finding Sarah Zucker and saying like, boom, I need to interview you for my podcast (laughs) and integrating that into my own life and in my body. Like when I'm talking to you, I just feel so, just such, so lit up, which is something I wouldn't be able to do if I was still existing in my head. So for me, this is integration. This conversation right now is my personal integration and think that we all have our own ways that we are integrating different versions of ourselves into our reality as we continue. So I love that. It's like podcast as spiritual practice. Um, (laughs) Totally. (laughs) But it's real. I mean, especially like the more, again, I've been reaching out to people more, talk going on podcasts more, putting myself out there and my feelings out there more because for years, I was like so branded. I was so like, I thought the way I was going to make everything happen for myself was like, keep it short, keep it cute, keep it on brand. And this past year, I've been like de-branding. I've been basically going, Jesus Christ, I'm a human being. Not only am I a human being, I'm a lot (laughs) of human being. And I think it helps other people more if I let them see that, if I let them see behind the curtain a little to see that like, look, I'm going through all this stuff too. I'm in my head all the time too. And then in turn, it helps me. It's helping me integrate better. It's helping me to hear other people's points of view on things that maybe I've chewed on a hundred times. And then someone else might have the key to finally me going, oh, wait, it's that. It's not this thing I thought it was. It's that. Like We so need that nourishment from others. Like That is what the point of all of this stuff is, is to connect us. And we're fundamentally sort of doing it wrong if we let it continue to Totally. And I'm so grateful grateful to be having these conversations because just a few months ago, we talk about these different timelines. I thought the meaning of life was to just isolate and to just be on top of a mountain looking out, not interacting. But you know, there's a balance Mm -hmm. of that. It's Mm -hmm. actually having these conversations. You go through the nihilism period where it's like nothing matters. And then I'm like out on the other side of that where I'm like, no, everything matters. This is, we only have one life. Why aren't we running around like the earth is on fire? Right. (laughs) I know. Oh, it's funny with nihilism, how it sneaks up on you. Like if you are a naturally philosophical person, like I always kind of anymore laugh at it when it's like you're running this equation in your head (laughs) and then it's like, oops, (laughs) I got to nothing matters. Like, well, I know that's not the answer. That means like something went wrong somewhere. (laughs) Because even if that is the answer, I sort of go, well, you can't function like you can't just go be a human being who puts on pants and eats breakfast in the morning if you're like, oh, but nothing matters. Like you just can't live like that. So if you're going to be alive, you have to rerun the equation to not end up at oops, nothing matters. Yeah. And then you can access it from different points on the spiral. You're not going back to where you were before that. You can actually right. from a different nuance and a different perspective. Right. And I personally find that if you are struggling with that feeling of nothing matters, why bother? Why try? I can't make a difference. Whatever it is, these kind of thoughts that come up for all of us. 
But if you really find they're coming up persistently for you, I mean, speaking to what you're saying about wanting to sit on a mountain and meditate, I've really lately been embracing the idea that we go through seasons, we go through personal seasons, and sometimes the correct thing to do is to isolate. It is to go, I'm overstimulated, I'm overwhelmed, I need to go be by myself now. I need to go have some alone time, some me time. I need to sleep 14 hours a day. I need to go steam in a sauna and just like listen to gentle bells and meditate. Sometimes that is the correct thing to do for your own well-being because it's just like the airplane. Like don't put someone else's mask on until you have your own on. Like you Mm -hmm. have to take care of yourself first because you can't help anyone if you're just freaked out and going full nihilism. Mm -hmm. But the opposite is also true of like recognize when you are healed, recognize when you are feeling better, when you do feel frisky, when you do feel like, ooh, like I want to go play like and let yourself go play. That doesn't mean you're not still a person on the path to enlightenment because you want to go play and party and have fun and talk to people. It's all part of the path. Yeah. And I think for me, self-care is my number one priority. If I don't Mm -hmm. have sauna sessions and all this stuff, like it really requires a lot of me personally to be able to integrate what I'm learning. Mm -hmm. The overstimulated Mm -hmm. nervous system we're taught is a good thing to always be over caffeinated, overstimulated. And I think it's so important for listeners to hear that there is another angle to that and to really provide self-care to yourself in whatever that looks like to you. Because for me, I need a lot of it to function. Same. I love a steam sauna. I love like a mineral bath. Give me a stinky water hole and I (laughs) am in seventh heaven. (laughs) Sauna, Yeah, saunas are my new addiction. It's funny how we go through these different phases and I've just been obsessed with sitting in a sauna at least twice a week. I have to be there. Wow, yeah, that's nice. It is nice and it's a luxury and I'm grateful that I know this about myself to be able to give myself what I know will provide more meaning and allow me to function in this world. So I always love jamming about with other HSPs, highly sensitive Uh people in the world, because (laughs) we see life through this like really high definition lens that allows us to have such creativity and allows us to provide this amazing art into the world. So Sarah, I just fucking love your art and you're such a creative being. I love jamming with you. Is there anything else you want to share with listeners? No, I think we've covered a lot of ground here. I mean, be good to yourself, be good to each other. And that's that's pretty much it. (laughs) Yeah, and don't watch the news or if anything, watch (laughs) watch the century of the self, if anything. (laughs) Right. Yeah, and use social media until it makes you feel bad and then take a break. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And both are fine. (laughs) Totally. Where can people find you online? You can find me at The Sarah Show pretty much on all those good old social networks and sarahzucker.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me, Sarah. Thank you so much. You made it to the end of this podcast. This means the world to me. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Feel free to hop on over to my podcast website, artofhumanity.io, for show notes or past interviews. You can also message me on social media. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. My name is Jessica Ann, and my handle is Being Is Human. That's B E I N G I S H U M A N. I'd love to hear from you and learn more about what you've enjoyed from this episode. If you really love this podcast, I'd highly appreciate it if you went on Apple Podcasts right now and left a review. It helps way more than you know. You can also share this episode with two of your friends who you think would enjoy it. Let's get the Art of Humanity movement going. Thank you for listening. Until the next episode, evolve your business with the art of humanity. Listen, explore, evolve.